Please open your Bibles to James chapter 2. Look at that. <laughs> James chapter 2. And, and this morning we're going to continue our, our series in James. James is a very uh, practical book. It, it tends to uh, step on our toes because it's so practical. It is not hypothetical. It's, it's about a faith that can be seen. About a faith that works. And, and we see that as we go throughout James. And, and today, James is going to, he, he's just going to wallop us again. I'm sorry. I just, it's what's here. <laughs> it's not me. It's, it's the Word of God. And that's what the Word of God should do, isn't it? The, the Word of God should change us. It should mold us. It should shape us. Or as 2 Timothy says, it should equip us for every good work that God would have for us. And so as we come to James, as we come to the Bible, we should always ask for God to speak to us, for God to show us, for God to teach us, to mold us, to shape us, that we would be honorable and useful to him and that we would be faithful in our confession of Jesus Christ. And this morning, we're, we're going to look at a text that, that I wrestled with I really wrestled with how to share this with you so much that I think I wrote this message four times. Um, in fact, the final draft came last night between 11 and 2.30 in the morning. So uh, it just, God has, and, and it's, it's just trying to, to figure out how to share with you. I, I have a great burden. I think you realize this. I love God's word and I want you to love it. I want you to know it, and, and I want it to, to speak to you and to shape you and to mold you. And so today we come to a text again that is a text that every one of us need to hear. Every one of us need to put into practice. A text that, that often, it highlights a problem that often sometimes we would seek to ignore. We would seek to, to think it's not that big of a deal. But James says that this is a very big deal. And that is that we are to have a faith that resists prejudice. Let me, let's play a game. Let's, let, let me ask you a few questions. So, so which one of these individuals is a Christian? Well, the guy on the left in a pew leads a, an atheist organization that sues Christians and, and the black guy on the bike is one of the charter members or head members of Bikers for Christ. Uh, let's try it again. The, uh, the young bald guy is a, a, a Christian music artist. The other guy is the leader of a Christian cult. Let's try it again. The... Poor individuals are Pakistani Christians, some of the poorest Christians in the world, some of the most um, some of the most persecuted believers in the world are Pakistani Christians. They have no standing in their society because they claim Christ. They often cannot work. They are persecuted and they are left to be poor and to die. That group of happy, smiley people. That is the leaders of the American Humanist Society, not Christian. I say all of this because the reality of it is, and what James is going to show us, you can't judge a book by its cover. And, and, and we can't look upon individuals through worldly culture, through sinful flesh, and know what God has in store for that individual. And thank God, somebody didn't look upon us that way. Thank God that somebody didn't, didn't look at a wild and rowdy 15-year-old that didn't grow up in church, that didn't know how to act, that didn't know how to dress, that came to a church and just <laughs> was a mess. But those people loved me and they wanted me to see me grow in Christ. And that's the point of today's text. The point of today's text is we have to fight 
our sinful and natural inclinations to be prejudiced against one another. To be prejudiced against one another. What is prejudice? Prejudice is a preconceived opinion or idea about an individual or a group of individuals. It's typically based on limited knowledge. It's based on stereotypes. It's based on irrational beliefs. It's simply this, to look on someone and prejudge them. To look on someone and think that you know their heart. That you know their value. That you know God's plan for them just by looking at them. Y'all be like, he's already gone from preaching to meddling, hasn't he? (laughs) Prejudice is not uh, new in world history. It was prominent in Jesus' day. In fact, much of the New Testament, if you read much of the New Testament, much of the epistle, it is written around this. The Gentiles are able to be saved. God is choosing the Gentiles and, and, and they are receiving salvation just as the Jews. That is, that is the, the, the overview of a lot of what is happening in the New Testament, of a lot of the fights that is happening in the New Testament. Uh, you think about Acts 15 and, and, and they go and, and Cornelius gets saved and they come back to Jerusalem and, and the missionaries report to the church. And, and I love this statement. They, they tell that, that Cornelius received the Holy Spirit and he believed in Jesus and, and he received faith just like we did. And, and the church council there, they go, well, ha, I guess even the Gentiles can be saved because of prejudice. Often we don't sense or see what God is doing because we've already made a judgment about God, what God would do or will do with an individual. We see this throughout our world. Of course, the the Jews were killed mercilessly, that's a word to say, by the Nazis and even today, what we're seeing in, in world events, what we came and we prayed for this morning. It is nothing but pure prejudice and hatred that has brought uh, Hamas against them. Uh, in our own country, Africans were brought to America. They were sold into slavery. And, and, and it was told that they weren't even human. That racism still lingers today in our culture, doesn't it? That those prejudices still linger today. And it's not just against one. We, we don't like anybody who's not like us. That's our natural, sinful inclinations. If you look different than me, if you act different than me, if you have different food preferences than me, something's wrong with you. And yet, the gospel tells us that anyone and everyone is of value to God. Anyone and everyone can be saved. In fact, Jesus came to earth as an atoning sacrifice for sin, not just for one group of people, but for all groups of people, so that we can go to anyone and everyone, anywhere, no matter what they look like, no matter what they like to eat, and we can say, Jesus died for your sin. If you trust and believe in him, you too can be saved. In Revelation 7, we're given this tremendous picture, this picture that should, that should fill our minds as we look to our world and we look to our neighborhoods. In Revelation 7, 9, we're told that there will be a day where gathered before Christ will be a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from every tribe, from every people, from every language, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Every tongue, every tribe, every nation, every skin color, Who are we then to look at people and judge a book by its cover? That's what James is saying here. Look at the text with me. 
chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we'll go through uh, verse 7 here. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold to the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in the good place, while you say to the poor man, you can stand over there, or just sit, on my, sit down on, by my feet. Have you not then made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? In this book, James has just challenged his readers. He's just challenged us to do the word. Now, when James wrote this book, you might not know this, he did not write chapter 2. He wrote one letter, one cohesive message. And so James has just gone from, from be not hearers only, but doers. And, and here are some practical ways that you are a doer. Serve those who can't help you, orphans and widows. Keep yourself unstained from the world. Here's another thing. Don't show favoritism to others. Don't show prejudice. Don't look on others and just by external means judge who they are, what their value is, what kind of honor they should receive. This all goes together. Chapter 2 is not separate from what he just said in chapter 1. Chapter 2, in fact, is further explanation of how not just to be hearers, but to be doers. Do you see that? I want to share with you three things as we think about this text. Three things as we, we think about why we should, should, should fight our sinful, natural inclinations to be prejudiced. Why we should fight that. Why we should, should seek to reject that and resist that from this text here. The first is this. Prejudice is unchristlike. Prejudice is unchristlike. Look at verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For a moment here, let's ignore not showing partiality. Because we often jump into this passage and, and we miss something that James has done here. Something that's very important for this section for us to realize. James has just given us one of the most beautiful, succinct summaries of what a confession of genuine faith looks like. Look at this. My brothers, hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He says here, my brothers. Well, why would he write my brothers. Well, because he's writing to members of a church. He's writing to individuals who have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are adopted into the family of Christ. That's why around the church we call each other brother and sister. We're all brothers in Christ. We're all sisters in Christ. We all belong to the family of God. God has removed all distinctions that this world would give to us and said, you are my child, you are in the family of God. That's why we say that. That's what he reminds them here. My brothers, no matter where you came from, no matter what your background is, no matter what your bloodline may be, no matter which side of the tracks you grew up on, if you come to faith in Christ, you are in Christ. I am in Christ, you are in Christ. We are adopted together as brothers and sisters, and we are to live as real family. Real family. 
These are those who have heard the gospel, the message of God, man, Christ, response. They have repented in faith and repentance. They, they have been brought into the family of God. And what does this saving faith look like? What is the content of such a confession? This is where I don't want you to miss what James says here. James is going to go on in chapter 2 and, and, and gets a, he gets a bad name for how he's going to argue in chapter 2, where he says, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. James isn't saying that a confession is worthless. James isn't saying that faith doesn't matter. Look, look at what he says about Jesus right here. He calls him Lord. That is deity. That is to acknowledge Jesus as God, to acknowledge Jesus as the one who is over us, the one who we are to follow, the one who we are to give allegiance to and allegiance alone. Jesus is Lord. He says, Jesus, his human name, that name, Yeshua, literally means God saves. And Jesus is the one and the only one by which we find salvation. Jesus is the only one that has atoned for us that we may be saved by our sins. He calls him the Christ. In the Old Testament, this would be the Messiah. This is the, the anointed one, the one that all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, when man sins and the curse of sin comes upon man, and man dies because of sin, because he has rejected God and rejected God's word, when, when all the way back there, God says, I'm going to do something from the woman, will come one that will crush the head of the serpent. And then the rest of the Old Testament has this thread running through it, the thread of Christ, where you see over and over again in different ways that God is going to save, that God is going to do something, that God is going to fix the problem, that God is going to eradicate our sin, that God is going to save us through the Messiah, through the Christ, through the one who he will bring, and that's Jesus. And Jesus alone, Jesus saves but don't give up. There's more. James gives us a unique title for Jesus. This is a title that, that we only see here in the, the New Testament. He calls him the Lord of glory or the very glory of God. Does that remind you of anything? Hebrews says it like this. That Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is the confession that James has, and this is the confession of those that James writes to. My brothers, hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. My, my brothers, remember who Jesus is. He is the Savior of all. He is the Lord of all. He is the Lord of glory, just like God. He is the Christ, the anointed one. And if we're going to live like that, guess what? Don't show partiality, because it's unchristlike. It's not like Jesus, the one who came, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. There is no one who is saved, who by their own merit is saved. There is no one who God looks upon and goes, you know what? You're, you're pretty awesome. You would be good for my kingdom. I want to draft you. That's not what it is. God looks upon us. And he sees our sin. And the only thing that you bring to your salvation is the sin that needs forgiven. And God looks upon us and he calls us. And yet we think we can look upon others and know what God's doing or not doing. Do you see why that doesn't look like Christ? Do you see why that doesn't reflect Christ? James shows us this sharp contrast. He shows us this beautiful picture of who Christ is and then says, don't show partiality because it's not like Christ. Remember the, the things that, that Jesus did. It was Jesus who praised the poor widow with her one little mite 
and not the rich, boastful Pharisee when they came to make an offering. It was Jesus who told the story of the Good Good Samaritan to shock his hearers. It was Jesus who sought out a tax collector named Zacchaeus. It was Jesus who taught about the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus. The rich man was not in a good place, and Lazarus had found favor with God. It was said of Jesus by his enemies, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God truthfully because you defer to no one, for you do not show partiality. If we're to follow Jesus, we must seek to see others the way that Jesus does. If we're going to live in a way that's Christ-like, we must live like Christ. We must have eyes that look beyond skin. We must have eyes that look beyond past. We must have eyes that look beyond language. We must have eyes that look beyond our own culture, and we see a soul in need of salvation and a Savior who can save that soul. Second, prejudice is unchristian-like. I'm making some words up. It's all right. I can do that. I have a doctorate. (laughs) It's unchristian-like. Follow with me. James gives us a hypothetical situation here in the fellowship of the the early church that exemplifies the kind of discrimination and prejudice that that he sees and and that we see. Look at verse 2. For a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, and you say, sit here. You have the good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there. Sit at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And prejudice is unchristian-like because it makes judgments on external matters. Uh, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, for from now on, We regard no one according to the flesh, for we are a new creation in Christ. The very nature of being a Christian is that we understand we have been made a new creation. We are not who we used to be. We we are not in the same destination that we used to have. We do not follow the same path that we are on. We are a new creation, and yet we think we can look upon others and go, yeah, I know where you're going. Do Do you see that? It goes against our very own testimony. Think about the contrast here that that James writes. Um, Ushers, you're you're on the stand here today, right? (laughs) The the, the two men walk in. One's a rich man and one is a poor man. You You can tell by his clothes that he's poor. The rich man is distinguished The poor man is a street person, a homeless man. And one of the things that I loved about my church in Titusville, we were on US-1 in Florida. And let me tell you something. If you were homeless and winter was coming and you lived in Michigan, would you want to stay in Michigan or go to Florida? You would want to go to Florida. And so everybody buys a bus ticket and they end up in Florida and they like to see rocket launches. And so they end up in Titusville and you never knew what was going to walk through the doors of that church. But we did have a people that loved everyone, no matter what they looked like, (laughs) smelt like. We loved them. We welcomed them. We blessed them in Jesus. We'd let them come in and get warm, and we'd give them food on their way out. Tell them Jesus loves you, and we love you. Here, this this man comes in. He's flashy. He's got his gold rings, right? I like to think he's got a big hat and a Cain, you know, and he just comes in and everybody fawns at him, right? Oh man, I wonder what he's going to put in the offering, right? We need him. We need that guy in the church, right? We got a building campaign coming. We need that guy. Everybody go meet him. Be sure to say hi. Be sure to invite him to your Sunday school class. And yet a, a person from the street walks in, no rings, no fancy clothing. And they basically say, yeah, there's seats up there. Please sit where nobody's going to see you or smell you. Oh, all the good seats are taken, but you can sit right here on the floor. There's preferential treatment and there's disdain. 
One's given the best seat, and one's given no seat. There's a great respect. We're so glad that you're here, and then there's no respect. Why are you here? Again, this is a this is an extreme illustration, but it, it, it's what we do in our hearts, isn't it? And sometimes it's what we do in our actions. And it's unchristian-like. Would you have come to faith in Jesus Christ if somebody in the church treated you like that? He's back to meddling. The heart of this man is ignored. His character is not given a second thought. Just merely by looking at him, the judgment is made. He is prejudged. There is a a prejudice only on the external things. As we go through James, one of the things that we've seen and we will see over and over again as we go through the New Testament is this. God looks not upon the physical attributes of us. He doesn't look at the external. He looks at our hearts. And friends, you can't merely look at someone and truly know what their heart is. You can't truly look at someone and know what God is doing or not doing in their heart. The only way that you can begin to sense that is to love them, to build a relationship with them, to have a conversation with them, to treat each and every person as someone who is of value to God, who is made in the image of God, and to whom Christ can redeem And when we begin to do that, then our gospel is heard. Then our message is heard. Often people are turned off from the gospel, not because of the message, but because of the messengers. As a church, we can't carry out the Great Commission and be prejudiced, judging only at the external things. We can't, as a church... Send people and money and effort and prayers to Guatemala and have disdain for Spanish speakers in our own community. Do do, do you see that? We, we, We can't send to the nations and despise the nations at the same time. We're called to love. We're called to be like Christ. Uh, look, I, I want to make a deal with you, church. All right, here's the deal that I want to make with you. I want this to be a church that, that where Christ is, is exalted and where the gospel is heard and people are loved. Do you want that kind of church? And so here's the deal that I want to make with you. This church is your partner in carrying out the Great Commission here where you live. I want this church, I want you to know that this church is a place where you can bring anyone and everyone from any background, and we will love them, we will honor them, we will clearly and passionately share the message of Jesus Christ every week. This is that kind of place. We're we're not here to make fun of them. We're not here to insult them. We're here to love them as Christ would love them and have us love them. That's the deal I want to make with you. You Bring bring your lost friends. Bring your lost family members. Bring people who are far from God. Let them experience worship. Let them experience the prayers of God's people. Let them experience the word of God passionately preached to them, calling them to a repentance. Uh, Bring them. Let them come. And let's see what God will do. That's the kind of place I want this to be. That's, the, that, 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 that's what I want you to have confidence in, that you can, you can bring whoever, and it's okay. Because we want everyone to know who Jesus is. And what, a better, what better place is there than this church? Prejudice is not Christ-like. Prejudice is not Christian-like. Third, prejudice is not God-like. It's not God-like. When you think about God and you think about who he is, what comes to your mind? What attributes of of God do you think about? His holiness, his righteousness, his eternality, his immutability, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, love, mercy, patience, faithfulness, goodness, 
Certainly all of these are wonderful things about God, but there is a, there's an attribute of God that is throughout the Bible that is very important that we often forget about. And it's this, God is impartial. The impartiality of God. God does not judge based on the external, superficial things of a person, but God looks upon the heart of individuals. God's grace comes not because we've earned it. God's grace comes not because of who our parents were. God's grace comes because God looks at the heart, not at the externals. He is impartial. Look at verse 5. Listen My beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? Look how he starts here. Listen, beloved brethren, it's it's coming, something's big, right? Listen, beloved brethren, listen. This isn't godlike. Not only is this against the the testimony of Jesus, not only is this contrary to your, your very own salvation experience, but this is not who God is. God has often chosen the poor. God has often chosen uh, the ones who who there is prejudice against from the world, and and they're made poor. I mean, that's why many of the people throughout the world globally are poor. Many are, are poor because they are oppressed by some form of prejudice that happens to them. And those are the ones who so often are the very ones in which God calls unto salvation. Our prejudice often opposes God's grace. And not only is it against God's grace, but it's often very foolish. I like how James brings this out. James says, are not the, the rich ones, who, the ones who oppress you and who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? The, the ones who the world celebrates, the ones who, who naturally we think are, are the ones to be to model after, the ones who, sh- who we should go after, the, the important ones, the good ones. Is it not true that those are often the ones who are against God himself? I mean, look to our own world. Look to Hollywood. Look to academia. Look to the sciences. Are, are not those the, the ones who are the most... Uh, platformed God-haters in our culture, and yet those are the ones often that we idolize and the ones to whom we would give preferential treatment for one way or another. Here's the point that James is giving us. When we show partiality, when we, when we do this, partiality means to look at the face, just on external matters. When we judge someone And we say, in our hearts or in our minds or in our actions, you're one for God or or you're not. We are unchrist like We're unchristian-like. And we're ungodlike. Now, listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Right? It's coming. Did you catch that? We're to be not only hearers, but doers of the word. This word is very clear. Don't hide behind your excuses. Well, I was raised this way. Well, I I come from a a different time. I've been hurt before. I just can't love these people. Such attitudes, such words have no place in one who's seeking to imitate Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Today, I want to encourage you, hold to the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Seek to acknowledge your prejudice, seek and ask for repentance, and seek to live in a way that rejects prejudice and looks to the hearts of people and, and lives out the salvation that you claim that you know that Jesus can save anyone. 
pray with me.